So how does the gut microbiome affect the eye? In today's education, we're going to be breaking down really what the gut microbiome is and what new research is showing how the gut can influence our eye health and several different eye diseases. Now, today's education is brought to you by our channel members. So thank you to everybody who is subscribed to the channel and then is a subscribed and contributing member to our channel because they help choose some of the topics that we cover. And I was able to put this out onto a poll between both our subscribers for our the main Dr. Eye Health channel, but then also to just our channel members. And we give priority to our channel members. So again, thank you all. Uh, we're going to be talking about this education. And so if you have questions, that come up, please put them in the chat and especially toward the end of the education because we'll do some live Q&A around the eyes. Without further ado, if you've ever had problems either with your gut or you've had eye problems or you're just curious about kind of the new research that's coming out, finding out that our bodies are a lot more connected than maybe we once thought, then this should be really interesting. So one of the big things about the gut microbiome is that, you know, we've, we've known about the gut and how the GI system works. And really all of the, when we say microbiomes, we're talking about an entire ecosystem of, of small microorganisms. This is bacteria. This is viruses. These are uh, archaea, eukaryotes, all of the microorganisms that you, the human eye cannot see by themselves. You know, we need a microscope to see these things. Uh, there's different microbiomes all around our body and our skin. Even our eyes have their own distinct microbiome and includes our mouth through our esophagus to our stomach, through our GI tract, and even out the other end. So it's very complex. And only about maybe five, six years ago did the research really start ramping up as new um, kind of testing was developed. And they started looking at uh, really the DNA or RNA of, uh, of all the different micro uh, microorganisms. So when I say the gut microbiome, I'm really referring to uh, all of that ecosystem, the small microbes that are living mainly in our GI tract. That's where a lot of this research is coming from. There is some research I found around the oral microbiome reflecting in the eye health, but uh, maybe we'll save that for another video. So the microbiome is really diverse. And with the research that's been exploding, they've been finding so many connections throughout the entire body. Uh, they find that the microbiome in the gut is related to depression. It can influence multiple sclerosis. So it's in fact affecting some parts of our brain. Diabetes and obesity, arthritis, connective tissue disease, heart disease, certainly IBS or irritable bowel syndrome, and even lupus. So it, it's, it's honestly a bit overwhelming how much research is coming out. But when it comes to the eye, and again, uh, for my profession, I think any eye doctor who maybe is hearing this or reading research on their own about the microbiome is probably not surprised that we're finding a deeper connection between the gut and the eye. Even though the eyeball is a bit unique, and I bet people don't know this, but the eyeball is sort of considered uh, kind of cut off or kind of immune privileged compared to the rest of the body. The, your, your immune system isn't fully aware that the eyeballs are even there. And that's because it's severed off through what's called the blood brain barrier, or sorry, the blood retinal barrier, which is very similar to the blood brain barrier, as well as the blood aqueous barrier. This is kind of the fluid exchange between the rest of your body getting into the eye to supply nutrients to the inner workings of the eyeball. Um, and so there are conditions like what's called sympathetic ophthalmia, where if somebody traumatically gets a damaged eyeball and pigmented cells inside the eye get exposed to your own body's immune system, you can develop an autoimmune response that your, your immune system kind of wakes up to the presence of the eyeball and then attacks the other good eye and can lead to permanent blindness for people. So uh, unfortunately for people who have to go to the ER for a traumatic injury to the eye, some surgeons have to make a tough decision if they can even save the eyeball, is it worth saving it? Or are they on a tipping, ticking clock where they have to choose to just remove the eye to, so to kind of save and prevent that sympathetic ophthalmia from attacking the other uninjured eye? It's pretty extreme. So the eyeballs 
relatively kind of inert or separated immunologically from the rest of the body, or in some ways it is. So there is there are two conditions that really came to mind of how, even as a student, when I was going to school for eye care, I was aware that there was a mysterious connection between the gut and the eye. First is a condition called Gardner syndrome, which is really a, a specialized version of what's called familial adenomatous polyposis. This is where you develop uh, different types of polyps within your GI tract, but you also develop other tumors throughout your body, and it's largely a genetic variant. Uh, the thing with Gardner syndrome in the eye is that when your eye doctor is doing an exam, we sometimes see these pigmented spots, like in the picture at the top there, that is called a chirpy, or, or which stands for com, uh, congenital hypertrophy of the retinal pigment epithelium. So the pigmented layer on the back of the retina is hypertrophied. It's some for some reason overgrown. And these are pretty common. If there's one in the back of the eye, we're not surprised or the doctors are not concerned. So if your doctor sees this, they may say, okay, you have a large birthmark in the back of the eye. We'll take a picture of it and just watch it, monitor it. Not a big deal. But if there's multiple of them, then your eye doctors know that, hey, that's a risk factor for Gardner syndrome. And so anytime I've seen a patient with multiple of these chirpies in the back of their eyes, uh, I will refer them to their family doctor and possibly a gastroenterologist to be looking for possible Gardner syndrome or, uh, or, or uh, colon cancer. Uh, people with Gardner syndrome have a really high risk of colon cancer. The other relationship to the eye that I think I've, eye doctors have always been aware of is a connection of what's called uveitis. If you've never heard of uveitis before, uh, it's basically a family of very extreme inflammatory conditions that affect the eyeball. And if you ever develop a uveitis or an anterior uveitis, or some people just call it an iritis, uh, this level of inflammation causes redness, pain. It can cause blurred vision. For some cases, depending on the cause, it can cause elevated eye pressures and even lead to glaucoma and uh, permanent blindness in some cases. So uveitis is pretty extreme and it can be caused by infections, autoimmune conditions. Uh, it can be, there, there's many different causes. Even a lot of causes, we just don't know what is causing it. But perhaps now with more research and looking into gut microbiome, maybe we're, we'll, we'll end up finding more possible causes. Um, but uveitis, uh, a, a certain form of uveitis, is, has been always known to be associated with irritable bowel syndrome. So that's always a question whenever I have a patient who does come into my office and I diagnose uveitis, I'm always asking them several questions running through their complete, like their systems of if have they, do they have a new rash? Have they been bitten by maybe, uh, maybe they've bitten by a tick in the past for Lyme's disease. Uh, but I always ask if they have GI upset, a history of diarrhea or bad bloating or other issues, uh, because there is a strong connection to the gut. So when digging into this research, and again, there's a lot of it. So we're going to kind of stay a little bit surface level for this, but I'll, I'll throw in some interesting thing for, for people who, um, just want to dive deeper into it. And I have uh, sources at the bottom of these slides. So if you want to, you can search uh, the PMID numbers or, or look for it on PubMed and you should be able to find these, these articles. And, and most of them are open access. So you should be able to read them if you want. Uh, the big ways they believe the, the gut is connected to the eye is mainly speaking through antigenic mimicry. Uh, dysbiosis, which if you've never heard of dysbiosis before, that means that there's an imbalance of good bacteria and bad bacteria in the gut. Uh, there, the truth is there's no, that's not a perfect analogy because if you have hundred percent good, ba good bacteria, that in, in itself is also bad. And you really want this nice balance this homeostasis of many different microorganisms living in your gut because they communicate, uh, through the lining of your gut. They can influence how uh, neurotransmitters are absorbed and basically produced in your body to connect to the brain and other tissues. Uh, so there, it's really important to have a good balance of microorganisms. But people who have this imbalance, then that is believed to possibly signal to the eye. And then gut mucosal lymph migration. And there's this big kind of concept with leaky gut. If you've never heard of leaky gut before, this is because microorganisms 
send signals through the mucosa, this gel, this mucus that lines your intestine. And they basically communicate and keep the epithelium or the surface underneath that gel, this mucus, keeps it healthy. And so what happens if there's too much bad bacteria, it can end up basically eroding away the mucus development. And then your intestinal wall is exposed to these harsh bacteria and toxins, which then can penetrate directly through the tissue and get into your bloodstream to travel throughout the body and possibly even the eye. So that's just kind of a quick breakdown of how we think it could be connected. So I want to switch gears and talk about diabetic retinopathy a little bit, uh, mainly because diabetes is such a significant player for eye health, especially here in the United States where I practice, where diabetes is, is a major issue for the overall just health of the economy uh, and all the, the people, the population. So diabetes, if you're not super, super aware of it, uh, diabetes uh, with elevated blood sugars can damage the lining of the blood vessels. And the eyeball is one of the only ways we can really look inside of the body and see active changes due to things like uh, diabetes, high blood pressure. Uh, and so if somebody's been diabetic and uncontrolled diabetic or just had diabetes for a long time, we can start to see the blood vessels get weak and they start to change, and they start to even leak and bleed into the eye. Uh, and if they're not getting, if a patient or if a person who has diabetic retinopathy isn't getting proper nutrients to the retinal tissue, the retinal tissue starts to release uh, inflammatory mediators uh, and basically starts calling new blood vessels to grow inside the eye and leak. And it can be absolutely devastating, and it can cause blindness very easily. So uh, thankfully, there's a lot of research on diabetes alone with gut microbiome and even on diabetic retinopathy specifically. Now, it's so complex uh, and you can, uh, again, I have sources on there if you want to read it yourself, um, but I just kind of broke it down to just to kind of a simple summary. So the studies uh, looking at the gut microbiome in relationship to diabetic retinopathy specifically did find uh, that, that people who have diabetic retinopathy have decreased levels of anti-inflammatory microbes, as well as an increased level of pathogenic bacteria. So they basically have a lot of bad bacteria and uh, don't have very much anti-inflammatory bacteria in their GI tract. And they overall have a decreased diversity. So again, you want a really healthy mix of different types of bacteria in the gut. Uh, and they, they basically started connecting that these individuals who have all of these, this mix of, of poor, healthy gut tissue uh, ends up having higher risk factor for bleeding and retinopathy in the back of the eye. This next slide uh, I put in here just because the, the signaling cascade of how the gut dysbiosis relates to diabetic retinopathy is even more complex than the previous slide I showed, but I love that they did highlight in the blue uh, that there's decreased insulin sensitivity and increased endothelial permeability, which plays a huge role in just how blood inside the, the blood vessels within the eye end up leaking into the retina. With macular degeneration, this is a this is one I spent a little bit more time on, probably because this uh, condition, if you've never heard of age-related macular degeneration before, this can be a completely devastating, blinding eye disease. And it's probably one of the conditions I am personally most afraid of myself ever getting. Uh, this generally is for people who are age 55 and older are at higher risk of developing macular degeneration. Uh, but people who are even uh, more nearsighted like myself, it's a little different type of uh, maculopathy, but uh, still it kind of looks and presents in a similar way. Um, macular degeneration is in many ways a kind of a degenerative tissue issue. Uh, the the tissue in the back of the eye called the retina that helps you see the very center bullseye of the eye receives a lot of oxidative damage because it's constantly being bombarded by light. It's the part of your eye that gives you color vision, allows you to see 20-20, allows you to read, be able to recognize your family's faces right in front of you. And so for people who are over the age of 55 uh, and the older they get, they're at that higher risk of this tissue degenerating, again, macular degeneration. And with this, uh, they can have reduced vision. 
and for extreme cases, complete atrophy and cell death of the retina in that center bullseye of the back of the eye that we call the macula. And then some people even develop new blood vessels called choroidal neovascularization in the back of the eye, which we then refer to as wet macular degeneration. And I have a whole dedicated video uh, here on the YouTube channel comparing dry macular degeneration versus wet macular degeneration. Uh, but a lot of research has gone into what can we do about macular degeneration. And uh, we know that diet plays a role and so do supplementation. Uh, basically, the more antioxidants you can have in the back of the eye, again, because it's su such a highly metabolic tissue next to your brain, it's the retina is an extension of your brain, as well as uh, the inflammatory cascades and how inflammation aggravates macular degeneration and accelerates it. That's one of the reasons why smoking is strong. Smoking cigarettes or any smoking is strongly associated with an advancement or higher risk of macular degeneration because uh, smoking dramatically increases inflammation throughout your entire body. Uh, the reason why uh, kind of one of the reasons why the gut microbiome is being studied pretty closely for macular degeneration is because we don't just notice an association and we'll talk about that uh, between microorganisms in the gut and inflammation in the eye, but we're also concerned uh, because what I have on here is the AREDS-2 supplements. Uh, one of the biggest studies uh, ever conducted on treating macular degeneration was looking at supplementation of like, can we give people uh, supplements of vitamin A, vitamin C, vitamin E, zinc, uh, lutein, zeaxanthine. Uh, these are uh, all different type of, of vitamins and minerals that have been shown to really help protect the health of the, the retinal tissue in the back of the eye. And the AREDS and AREDS-2 studies uh, were kind of major landmark studies for that. But there's this concern for the gut microbiome. If you have a poor balance of your, your microbiome, it may inhibit the absorption of certain vitamins and minerals, including supplementation. And there is a change in your microbiome throughout your life from when you were young all the way to your older and depends on your environment. And if you're somebody who's taken a lot of antibiotics, either as a kid or it's continued throughout your life. Sorry if it gets complex, people, but it's, uh, <laughs> my friends, it, it gets, gets really complex and we're only beginning to really better understand the gut microbiome. So uh, with macular degeneration, I found this pretty fascinating, just how it's related to metabolic pathways. Uh, glutamate, which is part of, plays a role in neurotransmission. They found that that is uh, decreased for people with macular degeneration, that they have decreased glutamate production and decreased neurotransmission to the retina. And that was at least done in mice. Uh, arginine, even when you have a decrease in arginine, you end up having an increased level of chorioretinal atrophy. So this is the, the death of those cells in the back of the eye. And that people with macular degeneration also had decreased fatty acid synthesis, which is also related to, again, more inflammation. Another big role in macular degeneration is it is somewhat genetic. There have been a lot of genetic studies that have found people who have uh, a couple different biomarkers may be at higher risk for macular degeneration. That's why if, if you, like grandma has it, uh, then you may be out be concerned if maybe you have it or your kids may have it. Uh, so it's always good to have an eye exam at least once a year and tell your doctor that maybe macular degeneration runs in your family. Complement pa fa pathway, especially what's called the complement factor H, is very strongly associated with macular degeneration. And a lot of research now is going into what's called the complement system uh, because the complement the system is plays a role in inflammation and modulating inflammation throughout your whole body. Uh, and they some of the newer treatments for macular degeneration specifically target the complement system. But there is some evidence in the microbiome studies that uh, higher levels of certain microbes basically hyper aggravate the complement system to work faster. And uh, that's not necessarily a good thing when you don't want that level of inflammation. Human studies, and I just want to kind of highlight because there's a lot of studies in the microbiome in animals, especially mice. There aren't as many human studies. And a lot of the human studies have smaller groups. So they're like maybe 13 or 30 people in a study. Uh, but I just thought it was relevant to kind of share that with people. Uh, 
Now you don't, there's not going to be a test after this about memorizing what types of microbes are in the studies that affect it, but it was fascinating that they do find higher levels of some microbes for patients with macular degeneration versus people who don't have macular degeneration, uh, as well as, uh, again, a dysbiosis, a change in the level of how many microbes, uh, good microbes versus bad microbes, again, more in the patients with macular degeneration. And again, in mouse studies, this one, again, I'm, I'm always somebody, I'm always personally very interested in diet and uh, nutrition. And this one, again, being in mice, they did look more specifically a high fat diet fed to mice, and they did find a higher level of a certain proteobacteria, which there therefore aggravated choroidal neovasculation in the mouse model where they purposely gave the mouse uh, basically macular degeneration. And then they fed them a high fat diet and they found it aggravated, it made it much worse. And then they interestingly took that same type of mouse that was given macular degeneration, they gave it a high fat diet, but then they took normal, the, the mice with a normal diet took some of their fecal, their fecal matter and transplanted it into the mice with that were being fed the high fat diet. And they noticed the choroidal neovascularization decreased. So it at least kind of has some implication that perhaps maybe fecal transplants, um, at least in this, in this sort of scenario helped neovascularization. And the authors of these papers at least uh, highlighted that uh, what they're thinking more about, that this kind of just proves how important the microbiome is in kind of signaling new blood vessel growth within the eye. The other one uh, that I found interesting was kind of the, not just looking at fat, but high glycemic, so high sugar diets, um, diets with a lot of processed sugar or that your body wasn't able to control its insulin spike. And they also found an increased risk of macular degeneration where high to low glycemic diets were, where they went from a high glycemic diet and then they gave them a low glycemic diet, it more or less arrested or even reversed some of the signs of macular degeneration in the, in the mice model. Now we're going to switch gears again and we're talking about dry eye because I, I know we've made a lot of content on this channel about dry eye. It's something that I'm personally very passionate about and study quite a bit. Uh, dry eye disease is still probably not the one that's the, the subject in eye care that's received the most research into um, in terms of the gut microbiome, but there is quite a bit rolling out. Uh, and one of the reasons or what they've been connected to uh, in terms of how gut microbiome affects dry eye has to do mainly again with inflammation. That's the, that's the big part of it. But then there is some uh, evidence that goblet cell density decreases and goblet cells make more of the mucus layers of the surface of the eye. And then uh, tear secretion and inflammation within the lacrimal gland, the, the primary lacrimal gland that makes most of your tears. Um, the few studies I was able to kind of read up on, again, just to give a generalization, uh, in humans, the big thing is Sjogren's syndrome. And for people who've never heard of Sjogren's syndrome, it's an autoimmune condition that severely it causes severe forms of dry eye. I do have a video on Sjogren's system, uh, syndrome of how we I diagnose it, the different blood tests that we order when we're suspecting it. Uh, and I have that in the description of the video if you want to check that out, if you haven't heard too much about Sjogren's syndrome. The uh, research did find that people with Sjogren's syndrome do have different gut microbiomes versus healthy controls. And interestingly enough, they found it very similar to people who had lupus. And people who have lupus have a much higher risk of having Sjogren's syndrome. They're, they're strongly associated. Uh, then patients who have dry eye but not Sjogren's syndrome uh, also have a different microbiome versus healthy controls. However, they did note that it's it's not quite as extreme as the patients with Sjogren's syndrome, but it's somewhere in between. Uh, that was just something interesting I, I thought was pretty cool. Uh, and then again, they're looking at a kind of a diet model using mice, and they found that mice fed a high fat diet, had increased levels of ocular surface damage and inflammation, so not surprising, uh, but also dyslipidemia. Um, so having poor diet with lots of fat in their diet uh, changed their cholesterol levels, uh, and that affected their meibomian gland dysfunction, which again, if you've ever seen any of our other content, meibomian gland dysfunction is uh, a major player in dry eye disease. So 
I kind of cut it short because there is a lot of other research on microbiome that gets pretty extensive beyond just these few conditions, uh, even things like glaucoma to some degree. Uh, but it's such new research and they don't really come to the best conclusions. So I didn't really want to go too in depth about it. But I do want to talk a few things of what you can do. If this whole concept of, hey, the gut clearly is affecting our bodies in many different ways, connected to different diseases, what, what can you actionably start changing uh, to maybe better yourself and your body? One of those big things is diet. There is some connection uh, and research showing that increased levels of short chain fatty acids is, in, is better for gut mucosal immunity. Again, you want to make sure that your gut lining, the mucus lining your, your GI tract is healthy. Uh, and they find that short chain fatty acids help with this. Uh, you can get short chain fatty acids naturally just by um, eating more whole grains. And I put not flour on there because we're not talking about just like bread. We need to look for whole grains, things um, including starches like cooked corn meals, potatoes, pasta. Uh, and there is some evidence that uh, increasing short chain fatty acid content decreases uveitis severity. Uh, again, that strong inflammation inside the eye. There is some evidence about caloric restriction, which is kind of going into the world of intermittent fasting. And I have heard some other um, more, more famous doctors doing research on uh, the gut microbiome. Um, I was just listening to a podcast, uh, a podcast I listen to uh, pretty regularly is the Proof Podcast with Simon Hill. Let me know in the, in the comments uh, and in, in below the video, or in, if you're catching us live, let us know in the comments there. Um, if you've ever listened to that podcast specifically or listen to other podcasts about the gut microbiome, let me know because I'm always looking to kind of hear new things and find new podcasts. The, um, but there was a doctor on there, uh, I wrote down his name, Will, Dr. Will Balsak, Balsawix, I believe he's published a few books, um, but I just listened to one of his podcasts as a guest this last week, and he was talking a little bit about maybe use of fasting, uh, especially after taking antibiotics. Um, but I, I'd refer you to that uh, episode of the podcast, and I'll try to link it in the description below uh, after we're finished with the education. Uh, but they did find that uh, caloric restriction also improved short-chain fatty acids, uh, and that it changed uh, hormone release, such as insulin and growth hormone, and also decreased inflammation and other uh, oxidative states within the body. Prebiotics and probiotics. This one was, uh, I bet a lot of people are interested because uh, even myself, I was a bit confused what the difference was of what's a prebiotic, what's a probiotic. A prebiotic is a food stuff or something that you will digest that doesn't have live like bacteria on it to help like kind of seed your gut. Instead, prebiotics are food things that are basically delivering nutrients to the already existing microbes in your GI. So again, you have healthy microbes and you have kind of maybe uh, I'll label it for simplification, unhealthy microbes. But when you uh, feed prebiotics to your good, healthy microbes, then they're going to be getting the nutrients and they're going to grow more and stronger, more robust. Uh, and some of these prebiotics in the literature at the top of the list is chicory root, which I've never had other than maybe a flavoring and coffee. Um, but I'm going to have to research that one a little bit more to see how I can get chicory root, see how it tastes and how I can uh, try it out myself. But leeks, onions, garlic, asparagus, apples, whole oats are all uh, listed as, as pretty healthy prebiotics. Probiotics, on the other hand, are any sort of a foodstuff or even possibly a supplement with live, live organisms. So um, there are probiotic supplements, and we can talk about that in a second. But as far as foods, diet, things you can start to maybe implement, uh, kimchi, which is a fermented... Um, it's, it's like fermented cabbage, which is very similar to sauerkraut, but uh, kimchi is a little bit spicier. Uh, it's got like, uh, it's it's delicious, but I personally can only handle it a little bit because the spice kind of aggravates me. Uh, the tempeh, which is fermented soybeans, which I, I personally really love. Uh, then da uh, dairy or a non-dairy yogurt uh, potentially has live cultures in it. And then uh, sourdough and kombucha. I put a question mark by that because again, it has to do with live cultures. Sourdough is, is made through um, 
through live culture, but in the cooking process, it kills the live culture. However, there is some belief that maybe sourdough is still good. Kombucha can have live cultures, but a lot of times it can also not have live cultures. So it depends on how, uh, if you read the label, if you um, buy kombucha on your own, some people I know make their own kombucha, uh, but uh, I personally love kombucha per, uh, personally, but yeah, so there, depending on the brand, you may have to look for live kombucha. That would have more probiotics. As far as probiotic supplements, this is a tough thing because there's really no major guidelines in healthcare or in medicine around probiotics. It's something that has been discussed for some time, especially around the, the level of prescribing oral antibiotics. Like if we have antibiotics on the eye, they can have an effect on the microbiome around the eye, but they generally don't affect the gut microbiome because it doesn't get through your system. But if you have a bad eye infection, uh, some eye infections will prescribe oral antibiotics. And I've even had, when I was doing my residency, some of my instructors, my mentors, we discuss if we should be prescribing a probiotic at the same time. And I haven't really heard too much of a, a different um, kind of thought leaders and uh, people with more authority on whether or not that's something we should be doing. Right now, uh, as far as probiotics, there's so many different like brands on the market. And just from my knowledge of reading some of the research, it feels overwhelmingly complex and tough for someone like myself to really say one brand would be better than the other. But again, there are um, doctors and researchers who are just looking at the gut microbiome and they may be able to... Um, they may be able to give you more direction if you're looking to take a probiotic supplement. The, um, but that's something I'm going to be looking more into personally, just to better understand probiotics of when I may be uh, pr best to prescribe them for my own patients. But right now, my biggest knowledge, uh, my biggest thing is discussing more with my patients if they need an oral antibiotic or if it's um, something that maybe we can hold off on uh, just to have better conversations about that, because uh, we know that taking oral antibiotics can really shock the gut microbiome quite a bit because uh, it's like a nuclear bomb going off. It just takes out everything good and the bad bacteria. The other interesting part in some of the research is fecal transplants. I know everybody loves that, that kind of picture in your mind, right? Uh, with fecal transplants, there is evidence and known in medicine that Clostridium difficile or C. diff, that fecal transplants is great for people who have that infection, which you do never want. Uh, and then for, but there's some curiosity with like inflam, inflam, inflammatory bowel disease, they've tried fecal transplants and, you know, it's kind of modest results. Diabetes, there are, they, are, they are finding some fecal transplants to help with early stage diabetes. Uh, and then for the eye specifically, there are more research I was reading, but um, it, it I kind of ran out of time or uh, at least I didn't find it super relevant because it's all in mice, but it's uh, they found some fecal transplantation did improve experimental uh, in dry eye disease. They found some benefit there. Um, at least right now, probably not uh, the best answer for humans going forward, but still very interesting and used more as kind of a proof that, hey, if we change the microbiome, we can change how disease states are currently progressing. And I just find that absolutely fascinating. So that is my presentation for today. Thank you guys so much for joining me here. Uh, we're going to be switching into some Q&A, but as always, I want to say thank you to our channel members. If you do have... Um, questions you want to be throwing into our live Q&A this evening, uh, please start putting them in the chat for me. Puts a bunch of question marks uh, and then put your question in followed by question marks. Uh, I do want to say again, thank you to our channel members for any of our members who are, who are here this evening. Uh, if they ask a question, they do get priority uh, as an extra benefit for being a member of our channel. If you do want to support us and uh, keep making these sort of free public education videos possible. Please uh, support us. It helps us uh, uh, just uh, potentially hire more people to help us out so we can keep making great content for you, um, as well as offer great benefits of being able to uh, help choose what lectures we'll have next, as well as um, just kind of help uh, support our channel. So thank you guys so much.
As always with live q and I do want to give just our medical advice disclaimer. Uh, I am not your doctor, um, at least here through the YouTube channel. I cannot give you um, personal medical advice. I think it would be unethical without a thorough eye examination. I think uh, everybody deserves the very best care possible, and that is with uh, a thorough eye examination in person with a local eye care professional. Uh, with given that being said, if you have questions, um, I will happy try to best answer that I can, but I'll be directing it in sort of an educational answer for everybody to be able to understand that. Um, and then we'll kind of go from there. So thank you. Looks like right away, we already have a couple of different questions. Um, I know uh, we did have a question right away that uh, it looks like perfect. Kel L, I want to bring this up. Um, can a bone dental infection cause issues with your eyes, like with the upper teeth to the sinuses? Excellent question. Uh, in fact, I think I might have seen either you post this question or someone else post this uh, on just a different video, uh, which I, I, I responded to, but maybe you didn't see it. So yes, it is possible for infections of the teeth um, and the gums to potentially spread up to the eye. Uh, there is a condition called preceptal cellulitis or full-blown orbital cellulitis uh, where basically bacteria can basic travel up into around the orbit. And this can cause um, a pretty nasty swelling of the orbit and potentially get even behind the eye. And it, it can, in extreme cases, can cause vision loss. Uh, if somebody is worried that they're getting a red eye inflammation, uh, especially if you have problems moving your eyes uh, or if your vision's starting to blur or change, of course, uh, you want to contact a local eye care professional right away so that they can evaluate you and determine if it's something that, if, first, if, if you are having a problem like preceptal or, or orbital cellulitis and if medication is needed and appropriate follow-up. Because for a lot of cases like that, uh, we're concerned about the bacteria or the infection getting behind the eye. And so I often see patients um, every day <laughs> until we see improvement with medication. Uh, so thank you. Hopefully that answers your question around that. Um, right away, we do have uh, Gail. Thank you, Gail. Uh, she's one of our channel members. I appreciate you so much uh, and for always showing up for, for these, uh, these lives. Uh, question about weaning off prescription medication and withdrawal may cause eye issues. Uh, that's a tough one to say, um, depending on the, the prescription medication, so many different prescriptions, uh, whether it be things like antibiotic can affect the eye to high blood pressure medications can affect the eye. Certainly diabetic medications, uh, can affect the eye. Uh, there's, there's so many different things that can play a role. Um, Definitely let us know if there's a specific medication you're questioning about as far as like antibiotics, like we were discussing regarding the gut microbiome, the, uh, the, the tough thing with weaning off antibiotics, like if you've taken like a seven day course or a 10 day course of oral antibiotics, then the following few months, your, your gut microbiome is going to try and regrow because again, the harsh antibiotics kind of cleared everything out the little bit that's left is going to be fighting for regrowth. Uh, and so there is at least some recommendations, again, by authors um, like that Dr. Will Balsawicz. I wrote down his name so I could try to pronounce it correctly. Uh, I, I'm listening to him speak several times on different podcasts. He's talked about uh, that patients want to try to be very cautious about just eating well, uh, avoiding foods and that may be hurtful hurtful or harmful to the gut microflora, uh, such as maybe drinking alcohol as being a bad thing, um, and maybe trying to eat more of the pre and probiotics. However, again, that's not uh, my expertise. So please listen to find his content on other uh, either his books or his courses or find his um, podcasts. I would refer to somebody like him who's doing the research and is more of an expert in that than I am. But if you are weaning off any medication, as always, talk to your local, eye, uh, not just eye care professional, but talk to your local family doctor as well or whoever prescribes those medications about your concerns going forward. So thank you. Um, let's see. Uh, 
I see uh, Carthial asks, what could be causing dry eyes only at night? Even with using using ointments and goggles, allergies perhaps. So it is true that dry eyes, uh, it, at nighttime, a lot of people do experience dryness more in the evening. And it's believed that perhaps it has to do with inflammation building up throughout the day. It also has to do a little bit with just like blood flow and how like your eyes are managing dryness. Because if you're blinking all day like me and my eyelids don't close 100% most of the time, then there's a little area of dryness that your body can handle a little bit, little bit, little bit. But over the course of a full day, that dryness progressively gets worse. It's like your body can't catch up to heal the surface. And so at the end of the day, it may just have built up so much dryness that now you're symptomatic and you're really feeling it. Uh, that's what, at least kind of a, a thought or theory behind it. Um, I know it's not specific in your question, but some people do sleep with their eyes open and that can cause a lot of dryness and irritation when they first wake up or open their eyelids in the morning or even the middle of the night. So that could be another thing. And then allergies do, uh, when I'm seeing a patient in the eye clinic for dry eyes, I am always suspicious of allergies. Not just because I'm thinking it's just allergies or it's just dry eye, but a lot of people have both. If you have dry eyes and allergies, it's like we're one plus one equals five. It gets much, much worse. Uh, and so that's a big thing that uh, depending on some of the tests that we do in the clinic uh, and what the eyes are looking like, we may not just be prescribing medications for dryness and lubrication drops, but also antihistamines to help battle any sort of uh, allergic response. Um, so hopefully that gives a little bit better insight into that. Um Gregory asks, is there, are there tests that you can find out inflammation levels in your body? Anything at home so you can track what foods are causing inflammation for you? There are different at-home tests that you don't even need to consult a doctor for. Uh, certainly, there are blood work tests that we do for general inflammation in the body, um, especially when we're concerned about more um, serious medical conditions. Uh, but as far as kind of the, the, the tests I think you're referring to, uh, such as your kind of food sensitivity tests. There are uh, a couple of these at-home tests. I've done one of them back in 2020. Um, and it turns out I was like highly sensitive to like garbanzo beans uh, and almonds. So I eventually had to like, like, which stinks because uh, chickpeas or garbanzo beans are in hummus and I love hummus. So I had to, uh, and I was having a lot of GI upset. And so I started to kind of wean off of those, those different foods um, and so it, it, I think it does give you a good idea, but always taken with a grain of salt and you should always, maybe if you do any tests like that, I can't name them off the top of my head, but you can probably search online. And, um, if you do get those results, I do encourage you to talk with your family doctor about it just to make sure that, uh, they can give you kind of their knowledge about, about those tests, about the accuracy of those tests. And if, uh, they recommend any sort of dietary or nutritional changes for you based on those results. Vanessa, thank you. It's good to see you here. She's another channel member. Thank you for your support. Um, have you ever researched the link of different ethnic groups and eye health? For example, Koreans eat a lot of kimchi, hence have studies shown reduced eye health problems in that region. I'm not uh, I have not seen anything specifically on like Koreans and, and maybe a relationship to kimchi, but perhaps there, there is something, uh, there, there are a lot of, um, different research and, and, and connecting different eye diseases to different ethnic groups or regions around, around the world. Uh, it's like some eye diseases like glaucoma, for example, tend to see in black individuals, uh, or African descent people with more of an African descent, they have a much higher risk for glaucoma. Caucasians and Asian descent, uh, a much higher risk of um, macular degeneration. Uh, and, and so, and like myopia is also something that we tend to see in um, people with uh, some sort of Asian background, uh, like from China, those individuals that the rate of epi uh, myopia is really high in those, in those different countries. Um, but as far as kimchi and diet, 
Uh, we know that food and culture, different like food availability and cultural differences does play a role in our microbiome around the world. So somebody who maybe lives in India and has always lived there eating uh, whatever food that they may be even eating from food that's grown in their region versus the food that's grown in where maybe I live here in the United States, we probably have vastly different microbiomes. Um, and then uh, Kel Al asks a great question. Thanks. Do I see an optometrist or ophthalmologist? It depends a little bit on where you live. I would say no matter what, uh, either way, uh, optometrist or an ophthalmologist is a great place to go. Um, I myself am a doctor of optometry here in the United States. I know in a lot of countries outside of the United States, an optometrist means a different thing versus an optometrist in the United States because we're trained at a very high level medically and we do a lot of even surgical procedures in the clinic as well as diagnose, treat, and prescribe therapeutic medications to treat diseases where in a lot of other countries, optometrists can't prescribe medications or do procedures. Uh, so it, it really is, it's a little bit harder to explain. Uh, but I would say even if you do see an optometrist, if you live outside the United States, then uh, they're still, if they notice something wrong with your eyes or if they can't take care of it themselves, then you they will be able to refer you to see an ophthalmologist. Um, a lot of times, again, in the United States, this is something uh, I treat most of the things that an ophthalmologist treats, um, but uh, I don't do invasive surgery. So I don't go into the operating room and cut open the eye uh, to do cataract surgery or retinal surgery or anything like that. Uh, hopefully that gives you a better understanding or, or explanation. Um, but a lot of times, because there's not enough ophthalmologists. In fact, they're not graduating enough ophthalmologists or training enough in the residency program. So the numbers of them have been stagnant uh, and possibly even declining. Um, so the, probably the, the biggest downside, if you do see to go see an ophthalmologist, because they're so highly focused and trained to do surgery, they oftentimes don't have very much time to spend with each patient. So you may see an ophthalmologist, but they may only spend five minutes with you. And then they have to get to the next patient because their, their training level is so high, they're in high demand. Um, so, so that's kind of the downside where if you see an optometrist, they may have a little bit more time to give you specialty uh, attention. Hopefully that's a good answer for you. Uh, Ooh, thank you, Louis uh, or Luis. Uh, is there an association with eye floaters and gut health? That's a tough one. I have not seen any specific research connecting those two, um, but perhaps there will be. Um, but I'll I'll keep a lookout for that, and maybe I'll post something in the community if I ever find uh, an answer to this question. Thank you. Um, Allison Hartrick, thank you. Uh, does anxiety cause after images? I, I can't say that anxiety directly causes after image. If people, if you're not sure what an after image is, uh, this is where if you stare at maybe a light or maybe a TV screen, and then you look away for a little bit and you still kind of see this after image of what you were looking at. Uh, I do tend to see that uh, people with higher amounts of anxiety are probably very self-aware and very uh, perceptive. And so I think if you're if you're very anxious and you have maybe heightened awareness of yourself and your environment and your your eyesight for sure, then perhaps you're observing it more than somebody who doesn't have such high anxiety. I think there could be a connection there. Uh, but uh, it's tough for me to say that anxiety, causes after images because after images are really uh, a response from the bleaching of the photoreceptors of the retina in the back of the eye. When light hits the photoreceptors, uh, they have to regenerate. And uh, so if you have, if you look at a really bright light or for a long period of time, it's kind of like using up all the batteries and eventually your body has to kind of restore the batteries. So it takes a little bit longer, but, uh, Hopefully, again, that gives you a little bit better answer. So thank you. Um, Fidelity just had, had a comment about uh, drinking kefir twice a day. Uh, I've never had kefir. Um, 
Uh, I don't I don't know too much about it. I believe uh, correct me if I'm wrong, that's uh, clarified butter, isn't it? Um, or it's a type of it's a type of yogurt or, or something. You have to correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> um, but I'll look into it. Um, I don't know of how how that really affects the microbiome. Um, Pablo, is this pre-recorded? It is not. Thank you, but uh, I appreciate you being here. I'm still working through a lot of these comments and questions. Um, um, thank you. These are some some great questions coming in. Um, the Greater Bilby, thank you. Have you noticed any increased rate of eye damage from COVID nineteen infection? So. COVID does affect the eyes in several ways. It's still a bit of a mystery because it's still such a new thing. Uh, we knew early on that COVID can cause uh, a type of conjunctivitis, a form of kind of pink eye. That's been known. Now, over time, we've started to see some more ramifications, even affecting the retina in the back of the eye. Uh, one of my mentors has a great lecture on this, and I wish I could call his knowledge to me. Uh, but at least from my own experience, I have seen at least two rare cases uh, of a retinal condition in the back of the eye, um, acute retinal uh, neuromaculopathy. Um, but the, this is uh, a case that's about one in one. It's basically one in one millionth chance of a patient having this. Uh, and because of COVID, I've seen at least two cases with uh, within as many years. Uh, and this is generally in females within two weeks after uh, having a case of confirmed COVID uh, where they had these permanent dark spots in their vision develop. And then we were able to scan the retina and perfectly line up where their uh, scotoma, this blank spot in their vision was, uh, and be able to match that with thinning and um, basically atrophy of certain parts of the retina. And then I was able to confirm that with uh, other published studies from other um, professionals around that around the globe that have been publishing on COVID-19 infection in relation to the eye. So really interesting. Um, unfortunately for those individuals, uh, we didn't really see much improvement over time and there's no known treatment for it. Um, but certainly again, COVID-19 is still a big mystery and we'll, we'll find out more as, as guess time goes on. Um, Hmm. So this is a, an interesting kind of comment from Gail. Again, thank you. Uh, you come inside on a sunny day, like if you're not wearing sunglasses, and everything looks darker. Uh, so there's kind of two things going on. If it's a bright, sunny day, your pupils constrict really tiny because your pupils will respond to the amount of light coming in. So if you go inside and it's really dark inside, your pupils will want to dilate to let more light in. So if it's really bright outside, your pupils may be constricted really small. And then you walk inside, everything will appear a little bit darker. Uh, that's a phenomenon experienced by people now using some of the meiotic eye drops that we're using for presbyopia, which are purposely making somebody's eye really pupil really small. And they're noticing everything looks dim. So that's one thing that goes on. The other part is, again, photoreceptor bleaching because it's so bright out. Your, your eyes kind of adapt to dim everything down, um, and there may be some bleaching developing. And then you go inside, and your, your photoreceptors have to kind of wake up and regenerate. The uh, When you are in a dark room, your rods, which are – there's rods and there's cones, cones for color vision, rods more for uh, just detecting light, uh, detecting movement – and for um, brightness levels. And so that's why even in uh, dim light, you can still see shapes a little bit. Uh, and that's because you have so many more rods that communicate and send information to your brain in order to see the, the, the dark room um, effect. But, uh, this is probably going to be the, the last question I'm going to use for tonight because it's uh, almost been an hour. And thank you guys so much for being here. But your opinion on virtual reality headsets and eye health. This is a very interesting question because now we have the new development of the uh, of Apple getting into the game of virtual reality and augmented reality to some extent. Uh, so virtual reality has been around, you know, since like the late '80s, early '90s. Like really, if you look up the really old technology, 
there are concerns or um, I would say concerns or worries about virtual reality headsets affecting the eyes in a negative way. I know they hire uh, these these companies, um, Apple, I know uh, Amazon, I know um, Facebook um, or Meta. These companies are hiring optometrists and ophthalmologists and eye care researchers and basically to work with their engineering team to make sure that the eyes aren't affected or to reduce uh, eye strain, asthenopia. The biggest concern I have with it is the fact that you may have a screen just few millimeters or centimeters in front of your eyes. So that raises questions if the screen element is going to be putting too much light into your eyeball. Uh, probably not based on our knowledge of the energy coming from screens, but there is some thought or concern. We maybe just don't know enough yet. The other concern is just the proximity of that screen to your eyeball. And if that is going to somehow cause a change or a shift or accelerate the rate of myopia development. It appears, at least from the little bit of literature that I've read, that the newer technology in these headsets, you don't have to really converge to see, like you don't have to cross your eyes to see the screen in front of you. They're set up so you're looking at infinity into the distance. So that may not have an effect. However, just because your eyes think you're looking in the distance, your brain may know that something is still right in front of you because that's a that's part of the training you receive in eye care is learning about what's called proximal accommodation or proximal convergence that your brain, even though you may think you're looking at something in the distance, something just in front of you, your, your eyes and your brain somehow sense it and already start to kind of try to use your eye muscles to accommodate for it. Um, those are probably the biggest kind of concerns I think most eye care professionals have around it. The other questions are if you are somebody who don't, doesn't have normal binocular vision, if you're somebody who doesn't even have two eyes that look straight, what if you're somebody who only has one eye? Will you still be able to see virtual reality or augmented reality? Will If you have one eye that goes up and down or side to side or if they cross, like, will they still be able to function and use those devices? Or will these devices cause more eye strain, headaches? How long is safe for somebody to use it? There's a lot of questions. There's such new technology. Uh, but I, I know that these, these industry players, they have a lot of researchers and engineers working on this because they don't want to cause health problems, uh, right? They, they probably are not going to be able to afford that sort of liability. So uh, I think there, there is a, I'm excited for it. I'm excited for the new, uh, new devices to come out. Uh, we've, I've personally already reached out to, to Apple to try and speak with any of their engineers uh, just to try to answer some of these questions so I could do better reporting on it. Um, but I don't know. They haven't gotten back to us. <laughs> but um, maybe someday. Uh, but I personally love video games, and I can imagine how awesome virtual reality headsets will be with with video games. Um, and and I I even outside of just entertainment, I can see the virtual reality headsets playing a huge role in healthcare uh, because you can possibly have like a virtual visit with your doctor without leaving your house, but being able to put that on um, and. and even more so, certainly for eye care, we might be able to do complete vision tests, side vision tests or field perimetry, uh, as well as check for vision and eyesight just with with like this sort of at-home testing. Uh, I know that's coming. So uh, thank you for asking that. And hopefully I'll be able to uh, make some more content around that to be a little bit more specific. But thank you. Um, just want to say thank you to everybody uh, for so much for being in here. Uh, we're going to be making more content. Uh, next month, we plan on talking, I believe, uh, based on our poll that we put out, we're going to be talking about autoimmune conditions specifically and how they uh, affect the eye next month. If you do want to continue, um, if you are considering you want to support our channel here, please check in the description below. We'll put a link there. Uh, and then we hope to see you in a future video. Thank you guys so much. Have an amazing night.